So this morning, we're starting on our grid power connection project. It's gonna be a multi-stage, multi-step project. Today, we have a gentleman out who's actually doing the excavation portion. And the reason we're not doing the excavation is because we have to cross a neighbor's property and it's on a cut bank. We wanna make sure that our neighbor feels really comfortable with what we're doing. It's very important here to build and maintain good relationships. It turns out our neighbor actually needs some other excavation done to kind of tidy up a few things, which we're more than happy to cover to kind of just thank him for you know being, being willing to work with us. Um, we didn't have to go across our neighbor's property. We could have accessed the power a different way, but it would have increased the cost and it would have been a less desirable connection. So we're very appreciative for our neighbor's uh, willingness to work with us there. And so we, we hired someone that he recommended, that way he feels super comfortable. And it turns out the guy is a1 plus quality. The power company has some very specific things they require us to do. Uh, burial depth, the diameter of the conduit, the straightness of the connection is very important because of the length of the wire pole. We're near the maximum, actually we're over, slightly over the maximum reach for a single cable pole of 500 feet. And so this gentleman, he's gonna rock and roll today. He said us being down there helping him really won't speed him up that much which is fine with us. We'd rather, we want to help if we're, if we can, but if somebody'd rather us just stay out of the way, we're fine with that too. So that's going to give us some freedom to work uh, a little bit on our timber framing. We've got quite a bit of work left to do. Last night, I got one of our braces cut. Alyssa was working on hogging out all these mortises. We did talk to our SIP company this morning. They're estimating two weeks or so for the arrival of our walls. Not very long after the SIPs arrive, the power connection will happen. We've got an electrician who's coming out to install our pedestal, which is where our meter will go. That's happening sometime maybe like around Wednesday, so a couple of days from now. A lot going on today. We're gonna try to kind of bounce around with the camera. We try to respect people when they do come on our property, when we hire contractors. If they let us film, we do. If they don't want us to, we want to respect them. Even though we're, we spend a lot of our time in front of a camera, it does not mean everyone else wants to do that. Today, our loft decking is getting planed and shaped. We just got a call from the mill. They've confirmed all the details, so I would think maybe tomorrow or the day after we should be getting the loft decking back. We'll have to store it and keep it dry until the sips get here, and in theory, all that stuff, the loft decking, the sips, the roof, and all that stuff will happen really quickly. This red tape is burial tape, was provided to us by the power company, and they require it to be buried at about 18 inches below the ground to let people know who dig. There's a power line there. When we dug our water line trench along the hillside here, we were going to bury a two and a half or three inch conduit just in case we needed to bring power from the backside of our property over the hill and down to the house. We did not do that, and it worked out good because that's not where the power is going to come to our property. It turns out it's going to come in over here near the end of the sawmill spot back here in the corner. So this is kind of a layered strategy. We're actually going to be cutting this bank back to create a small road. It's going to be just wide enough to get the backhoe through here and an ATV, which will allow us access to the back of our property without having to go on the highway. It works out really well though, because the excavator had to dig a road in order to dig the trench for the power line anyway. In this situation, that was really good. We did not want a road where our water line is going up the side of our hill because we did not want to compromise the tree root systems. In this case, it looks like we may be able to get away with not doing any tree removal to make this road possible. So we're having to give some thought to that stuff. This also provided the shortest distance to connect to the power grid. And that's important because you pay for your connection by the linear foot. Additionally, not using a direct burial cable and using a conduit should allow us to hopefully, if there ever was an issue, never have to dig up this trench again. And if there's an issue, they can just pull a new wire through. To get this far in the process, we've had about three visits from a staking engineer who has a GPS computer system that he can use to kind of walk and map and sort out where things are on our property. The reason the transformer is going here is if we go any farther, we would actually have to do what's called a junction hut, which means they have to bring the cable up out of the ground, terminate it, start a new cable and go farther. 
because of the length of the pole. They can only go about 500 feet on a single pole. The junction hut would increase the cost of installing this service. We also happen to be at the maximum length of secondary voltage or what they recommend. So from the meter to the house is approximately 200 feet. The power company themselves will not be able to come out and pull this cable for a while. Could be a month or more. There are limits on the roads right now. We have what's called breakup limits and they're not able to bring their equipment out here, I think, unless they get a permit. I'm sure that increases the cost. We're willing to wait. We're actually doing fine right now with our solar setup, batteries, and our generator. So that's the main delay with getting connected right now. We wanna get this done, the excavation portion, because our soil is the kind of soil where if it's too wet, it's mucky and it's hard to work with, and if it's too dry, it's really compact and hard to move. So this small road has been dug along the hillside here, and we're actually crossing from our property to a neighbor's property somewhere in there. We're going to have to dig the straightest possible conduit trench because at the maximum reach of a single wire pole, we're adding a three inch conduit instead of the two inch that they normally require, which increases the cost. But if it's not straight enough and they can't pull the wire, we'll have to put the junction hut in in which case our cost of everything just keeps going up. We'll be adding a small cut in this road up this direction to access the backside of our property. And then we have a road that goes up the ridge to the top where our cisterns are stored. So hopefully this will actually increase the usability of the backside of our property, which as most of you already know, is the majority of our property. So we had locates done about a week ago and they found a phone line. So we've expose that already with a shovel. So that was really the only major hurdle from here. We basically have to dig a trench from that power pole there, following the staking route provided to us by the power company, bury the conduit, backfill it, and then we wait for them to pull the wire. The utility company will actually be replacing this power pole at the time they put our power connection in. So we've got to do some things to make that easier for them. It just worked out. It looks like our neighbor is going to get a new power pole too. The decision to connect to the grid still is not sitting well with us. We understand the pragmatic and logical reasons why we're doing it. It makes sense for our family, given all of the situation and conditions that exist on our property, our budget, our future, and stuff. But Alyssa and I are passionate about learning to be self-sufficient. We certainly have a long way to go. This house project has become larger than life, which we knew going in. It's really helped us to develop our character so we're going to move forward with this decision. We're going to own it. We're going to try it out. It will allow us to kind of give us, give ourselves an apples and oranges comparison with our experience with living with solar. The beautiful thing about this decision, given our age and our circumstances, is it's not a no never decision. We still have plenty of time in our life if we choose to move back to a grid tie system or if we wanna live off grid, we can still do that too. So we feel like we have a lot of options. I know we'll figure it out. We'll keep making mistakes. We'll keep doing things that we look back and think, well, it made sense at the time. It doesn't make sense anymore. That's all part of this journey is learning. And hopefully when we're all said and done, <laughs> we'll be really happy with the things that we did. We'll live a life with no regrets and hopefully we'll be comfortable for all this darn hard work. Julie wants them. Oh, do we do always do what Bugaboo wants? Most of the time. Most of the time, because <laughs> he has Most claws. Most of the time, Bugaboo. Okay, have fun, Bugaboo, whatever you're gonna do today. Okay, have fun. Yeah. Oh, wow. I left 30. Is it that late already? It's been a chaotic morning again. Nothing is going according to plan or according to plan. So I we're improvising. I feel, I feel because we've had multiple days in a row where we're just scattered and so much is going on. I feel like my head feels out of the game. What's hard for us is that weekends are often our most productive time because we, the world kind of shuts down so yeah. we can focus on work and we can yep. just put our head down and crank it out. 
weekdays are a little harder. The phone's ringing. I've already had like three phone calls today. We've got workers here, which is amazing, but also weird. So it feels weird for us because we were all geared up and ready to be jumping in trenches and covered in rocks and dirt. And uh, yeah. I think we still may do that to some degree, but yep. not to the degree we thought. So yep. now we're having to mentally switch to this and I don't know. Oh man, hold on. I'm glad you're out here to help me. Yeah. You make quick work of those mortises. I'm doing okay. So last night I worked out this brace. I wanted to get all the way through one so I felt confident that I knew what piece we were making and I wanted to make sure that it actually fit. I haven't been able to truly test fit it so I'm gonna go ahead and slick this down a little bit more and that way we can assemble a full brace. I wanna feel good that it actually fits perfectly before I go ahead and make the rest of them. Uh-oh. I got blood on our timber. Huh? You okay? Yeah. I don't know how I did that. Maybe a little. I'm scared to put it in there. I'm afraid it won't come back out. Give her the death blow. Ain't gonna we need Aaron's mallet. Right, we need Aaron himself. We should have built a commander by now. It seems like a ritual or a rite of passage to timber framing. We don't have one. So I'm just gonna drop this piece of arch. Oof. Oof. Uh, I think it's going. Can't tell. I don't know if the mm. brace just needs to go in. It's yeah, jammed up it. in the mortise there. Oh man, it's, it's, ah. She don't want to go. Got to take it back apart. I think it's right there. See huh. the end of this piece never yeah. got flattened. All right, we're gonna do a little troubleshooting and we'll let you know what the problem was. We got her to fit. We actually had a couple problems going on and you have to use like logic. You have to use your brain to figure out why it won't seat properly. Uh, with our workshop, I was actually fairly involved in the fitment, but not when the frame went up and all the braces went mm -hmm. in, just when the bents were assembled. So I got to see a little bit of the this, that, this, that kind of depths or whatever. Um, so in this situation, we actually narrowed it down to this brace being short. It's too short by, what an, is it? An eighth. By an eighth of an inch. And so the tapered side of the tenon was actually um, hitting the mortise because the, 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 the piece is too short. So it's trying to fit in a smaller, a smaller triangle than the triangle we've created. So we kind of cheated and we just beveled down here at the mouth of the mortise so that it can just move all the way in. It doesn't fit perfect. The piece on the bottom here is actually one of our peak pieces, our gable pieces. And it was the first piece that we made in this whole shebang. And so uh, it's not perfect. Um, and then I think I just had a pounding headache last night. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what I was doing Precision on this brace. Precision goes out the window. There, there's some night. stuff on this brace I am not proud of. <laughs> I don't know what the heck I was saying. I'm like, I don't know. It's a good test though. It, it definitely will work if we follow the plans and get the dimensions correct. One of the challenges with this brace stock is getting a true 45 degree mark. Because if you're off by just like one degree, your tenons will just be wrong. So I think I'm gonna try on the next braces to use our stair gauges on our framing square. It's a much bigger triangle than using this combination square, which just the inconsistencies in the face of the timber could put you off by just a hair over 12 inches. And that was another issue where our tenons were just a hair too long. They end up fitting in the mortise, so that's good. Um, but hopefully we can do a little bit different work on the next braces. For the braces for our frame, we uh, did those expeditiously, and by we, I mean Jeff and Gabe. And they used the chop saw and the table saw to knock out the braces really quickly. I think I mentioned last night that I don't think we can do a centered tenon on the table saw because it doesn't reference the face, it referenced the center of the timber. And there's no way for a table saw to do that. That said, 
this will speed up the process a lot if we can find a way to do it. So I wanted to check. The other difference is we're using six by eight brace stock and the braces in our uh, frame are four by six. They're much smaller. The tenons though I think are a similar length. So I wanna check the maximum height of our table saw to see if by some dumb luck, we might be able just to run these through the table saw. The difference is five minutes versus an hour and a half. No way. What Three on the money. Boom, boom, boom. So we could, if we can figure out how to do a centered tenon on a table saw. I think we should go on a short hiking break with our London fogs. What do you think? Um, okay. So wrong not being covered in dirt right now and stressed out. You know what feels really wrong? That's I agree hundred percent. What feels really wrong is that his trench so far is longer than our entire waterline trench that took us a week. Yeah, that's disgusting. So there's a bunch of uh, Schedule 80 conduit down there around the corner on his trailer. Okay. Um, I'll run his truck down there and pick it up. And then uh, it actually needs to go up near Close the, the junction box. Um, yeah, because it's got to go under the road there. Yeah, some of this might need to come down. I think we're a little heavy down there. I agree, yeah. If you want to move a little bit of it down. Oh, he's, he's running out already. Yeah. So these small tools are called a stair gauge and they affix to your framing square and they help you to create very repeatable patterns. So I have this set to 12 inches on this side and 12 inches on this side. And now when I lay my square on my timber and press both of those against my timber, I get a very nice 45 degree angle. Of course, timber framers rarely worked in degrees. They always worked in inches of rise and run. So we know that this is a 45, but they would be more likely to use a 12 and 12 pitch to create angles. And the other nice thing about the Sterrett, um, which is the brand of these stair gauges, is they have such a crisp uh, heel right here that when we create the uh, marks for our brace stock, we're actually going to use a marking knife to do that. So we'll make a mark on the timber like this. And then what'll happen is that little notch on the framing square, if you listen, will sit right in that notch, just like that, giving you a very accurate measurement. So it's just one small benefit to that tool. I'd like to do this over using my combination square because I'm finding that my combination square is a little too reliant on the face there and it has too narrow of a surface to give me a predictable angle. So we'll try this for a couple braces and see if we get a better outcome than we did on that guy.
I do feel like the framing square worked a little bit better, but I think I bumped my square and one of my stair gauges got off and I had to make a ton of corrections to my lines. So hopefully, hopefully I followed the correct line. And then over here, all kinds of corrections. So um, I think this is just a matter of patience to make progress. I think it's worth it to at least try the table saw on this guy just to see if it works and if it in fact speeds up the process but doesn't negatively impact precision. So I think we'll give it a shot. guys think that was done on a table saw and with the circular saw in like 15 minutes maybe 15 minutes I had to take just the kernel or whatever it is out of this corner and then kind of just check my lines and then chamfer the tenon we'll find out right now whether it'll fit or not Alyssa says this guy's done so we're gonna pick on him and I randomly grabbed number four post oh that's mine too all right, so I, I just have that hunch like things won't quite fit kind of like they didn't before, but let's do that as a end to tonight. Dun, 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 we did it. No one really knows how. It's a mystery. Alyssa was saying, how can that be? Every mortise is exact. And I'm like, no, every mortise is unique. So every piece has to be fitted to every single piece. And you really don't want them just to go plunk and fit yeah. together loosely. So this is pretty tight. We had to do a little shaving. It seems like maybe our chain mortiser uh, has a, a, a potential to actually turn the, the mortise ever so slightly, like a sixteenth of an inch in its length. Maybe. We'll have to check it out. If we have that problem on every piece, we know we've got an issue. Yeah. Um, too late now. Yeah. <laughs> but we got it figured out. We just did a little shaving. Nobody knows because the mortise is completely hidden. So. And on that note, it's time to clean up and we'll be back at it tomorrow.